When people meet, they're often interested not only in the name, age, or occupation, but also ask about ethnicity. And almost always, the answer is one specific ethnicity. Many people are proud of having the so-called pure blood. But to what extent is it actually possible to belong to just one ethnic group? And how was it formed? A single molecule called DNA can answer these complex and global questions. Hello, my name is Daniel and I'm a nomad. At least I'd like to introduce myself like that. I'm not sure I'm telling the truth though. It is true that I was born here in Almaty. My father's from here and my mom is from Georgia. And I came here to see if I can discover myself. In this episode of Searching for Mystery, amazing discoveries. Have there ever been real Adam and Eve? For now, for sure, we know that there are no one ancestor. What does the genetic code of modern Kazakh people hide? And the blend of these two elements formed an anthropological type, which is common for Kazakh people now. Even before the genetics, Kazakh people knew how important it was. This information was very important in preventing marriages between close relatives. What will our narrator's DNA test reveal? Our test results are issued in this format, in form of a book. In your case, we examine the Y chromosome. In 1992, my parents decided to move to Russia and they took me to Krasnodar. We didn't settle there and moved to Australia in 1997. I graduated from high school and got a degree there. I worked in online education and had my own business. In 2018, I returned to Almaty to try to live an adult life. I work at the Kazakh British Technical University. I teach political economy, social psychology, and cultural studies. I was married to a woman from Almaty, and I have a 13-year-old son. My father hails from Moskimen, and my mother is a native of Tbilisi. Now, why am I so attracted to Kazakhstan? I don't know, it's probably because of its ancient culture. See, there was a lot of tremendous events that took place here, uh, and the ninth largest state was born in the center of Eurasia, and now, I have a chance to study it without silly stereotypes and false attitudes. I can provide the objective study of what actually took place here. I love traveling around the world and looking for fascinating places that most tourists don't even know about. When I became independent, I realized that I really want to live here in Kazakhstan. And today, I'm a resident of this beautiful city, although I still have an Australian passport. I think that is it. That's the place where all my genetic insights would be revealed. Let's go. Now, modern man is like a cocktail made of different people from different continents. Now, with the help of genetics, you can easily find out the person's place and time of birth and also determine that person's ethnicity. Here they can tell me exactly who my ancestors were. I came to this lab to find out why I'm so attracted to the nomadic civilization. To the smell of the oven as the bread is being made, to the wind, the steps, and all the horses running to those steps. Recently, thanks to the development of science, more and more people want to know about their origin. It is understandable that everyone wants to trace their roots, and I'm no exception. Now, in order to get in and get the actual DNA test done, you got to put on, obviously, a couple of these funny things. Otherwise, they will not let you in. So here we go. Okay, fully equipped. Let's go. Now, I think that's the right place. This is DNK, so that's Russian for DNA. So let's go in. Hello. Hi, I'm here to do the DNA test. 
A genetic lab can come up with the most accurate result. It is possible to reveal biological information about ancestors within several generations. At the moment, I'm in this lab, and the data they'll get will expose my ancient relatives. Here, with the help of DNA, I'll finally know what is written in my genes. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is also called the building blocks of life, since it stores the genetic code, which is the basis of heredity. The molecular structure of DNA was discovered by scientists Jameson Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. The DNA molecule resembles a letter. The information in the rungs of this letter is encoded similar to the letters of the alphabet. These long chains form orders just like letters compose words. Each order is a section of the DNA helix, and it's called a gene. For example, one gene can make color of your eyes blue, the other one makes your hair brown. All the genes in everyone, with the exception of twins, are different. Surely, it's impossible to understand this whole process without an expert. Any genetic material is suitable for research. Blood, hair, nails, bone, tissue, earwax, or in my case, buccal epithelium swab. The buccal epithelium is scrapped from the inside of my cheek. It should be noted that the equipment of certain labs allows the analysis of genetic material coming not only from different parts of the human body, but also from objects. So, in order to determine which haplogroup your ancient relatives had, it's enough to submit some of their personal belongings for a test. Well, for example, a button from a shirt that belonged to your great-great-grandfather is good enough. If there are traces of your relative cells, experts will conduct the test. Excuse me, I'm actually very interested to speak to someone to find out how it all happens. Is that possible? Yes. Cool. Where can I go? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. We've just took a sample of your biomaterial. The sample is sent to our laboratory since the whole process is done there. Initially, the DNA of your epithelial protein is isolated. Then we carry out its authentication, i.e. accumulation of enzymes of your Y chromosome in the male line, and then we run the applicants through the analyzer. That is, we have a device called a sequence analyzer, which ultimately gives us raw data. We process them and search them through the international or Kazakh databases. The database is a kind of reference book that includes information about the ethnicity of people. First, the results are checked and compared with the results from the haplotype reference database. In other words, these are the clusters of genes in the body that are inherited from a parent. Then, scientists determine a haplogroup or a group of similar haplotypes from a common ancestor who had a mutation inherited by all descendants. The data obtained are verified for the gene sequence and correlated to the results found in appropriate databases. This database is a result of a Kazakh research project. It was carried out here in our country. There were field missions to collect the biomaterials of the people of Kazakhstan. Therefore, in addition to determining the group, we can verify the shajere. Uh, you mentioned this word, shajere, what, what does that mean? Shajere is the... Shajere is the genetic chronicle of Kazakh people who have passed this information on from ancient times. Shajere is a genealogical chronicle, not only among the Kazakhs, but also among some other Kipchak people. Usually, it is written or oral list of ancestors in a direct male line. For Kazakh people, Shejire always had a truly sacred meaning. In addition to genealogic data, it includes presentation of the most outstanding events in the life of a particular clan or tribe. That is, it was a kind of annals of the nation. Many scientific projects that confirmed the information stored in Shejire using genetics currently being carried out in Kazakhstan. Personally, I wonder in what form this information was passed and why this chronicle followed exclusively the male lineage. Why the male line? Because historically, back in the days, Kazakh people live in patriarchal society and they still do. 
Therefore, this information was very important in preventing marriages between close relatives. Okay, I see. How do you determine the location and time of birth of a person? And how likely is it that you will be able to get that information? Surely there is a human element and it's a challenge if some mistakes occur or someone's bloodline was interrupted. There are many factors. But now in our company we genetically confirm treasuries of families, maybe with a few minor changes. In this version of our test, you can see the information of Kazakh tribes. Well, this is a table that shows the closest Kazakh tribes, sub-tribes, and if we know it, we can also find out the related Kazakh clans. Basically, 90 to 95% of our Kazakh clients actually confirm their origin. So yes, uh, this information is actually passed in genes and can be verified. Okay, wow, these are all the, all the different tribes. Yes, indeed. We have a lot of Kazakh tribes and some of them are quite large. I mean, they are more common on the territory of Kazakhstan. All are of different origin, of course. They could have a Mongoloid part or they could hail from China, Europe, the Middle East and also India. Scientists have found that a large number of tribes actually lived in the large territory of Kazakhstan at various times. But how did the Kazakh nation grow out of many people? People always had to adapt to harsh climatic conditions. The nomads were forced to abandon agriculture as the ancestors once abandoned hunting and started to breed cattle. They didn't leave the rough step, but changed their way of life. In the 6th or 5th century BC, people began domesticating animals and moving with their herds. In order to feed their cattle and survive, nomads were forced to roam and cover long distances. Due to climate change in the steppes, many nomadic people began to seek for new pastures. They were not driven by a desire to conquer, but simply by the threat of famine. And this process took thousands of years. That is the way the human movement has unfolded for centuries. Many settled nations had to relocate, leaving their homes behind because of endless wars. Jacques Alexabedov is a historian and one of the leading experts on the nomads of Asia and Middle East. And this is what he says. These newcomers, let's call them Eastern nomads, who included various Turkic and Mongolian tribes mixed with the local population, which was mostly Turkic. And the blend of these two elements formed an anthropological type, which is common Kazakh people now. This process took place in the middle and in the second half of the 13th century. Actually, this was the era of the Golden Horde, when many tribes moved from the territory of, figuratively speaking, Mongolia. Many sedentary nations who didn't leave their lands suffered disasters and disappeared after cruel wars. Because of incest, facial features of people in some areas had changed. After invasions of Huns, Roman Empire collapsed and entire civilizations perished. These civilizations didn't survive and fell prey. However, the nomads did not stay in the cities, but left. In Soviet times, there was a historiographical myth that the Saka and Scythians lived, relatively speaking, from the Ula to the Danube rivers, and there was a single Scythian Saka world. As a matter of fact, if we talk about the original Saka and Scythians, they definitely spoke the Indo Iranian language. But those original Saka and Scythians, they lived mostly outside of Kazakhstan. These were, relatively speaking, Saka Haoma Varga, Saka Paradaraya, and Saka Tigra Haouda. They only partially live in the territory of Kazakhstan. It means that other tribes mentioned by Herodotus lived in Kazakhstan territory. These were the Argipayans, Arimaspians, Isidons, and other tribes. At the beginning of the 13th century, the so-called Mongol invasion began. The Mongols marched on to the west. They were more united than the Europeans, who fought on their own and eventually lost. The power of Mongols was in the army made up of all the steppe tribes. 
since they all had a common goal, new territories. Mongols didn't withdraw until Europeans started to unite. It's around that time when nations, as we know them today, were formed. The formation of a nation has absolutely nothing to do with genetics. Genetics can, so to say, be the basis, relatively speaking, one of the conditions for the formation of a nation. But a nation is a society that is formed, relatively speaking, in the industrial age, when first of all, national intellectuals arose and a system of secondary and higher education appeared. It totally homogenized the space and established a single interpretation of history. A person may have a certain origin, but be a member of a nation absolutely unrelated to his or her origin. Bayezid Yunusbaev, in his paper, uses genetics to estimate the time of appearance of genetic assets. He took Turkic expansion as an example, studied various Turkic nations and found out that the ethnic and genetic community, which later would be known as the Kazakhs, was formed in the 13th century, when different ethnic groups mixed. There was a local autochthonous ethnic group and the second group was the nomads from the east. Having mixed, they created a new genetic type, which is common for Kazakh people now. Also, according to Jacques Selig Sabinov, the genetic studies in recent decades have shown that the Scythians, also known as Saka, were completely genetically different. Certainly two nations had an animal style, but common cultures are not the evidence of common genesis. The same theory was proposed by Zeynala Samashev in his work in 2017. According to his studies, the nomads who lived in Altai, Eastern Kazakhstan and Central Kazakhstan were genetically different from the Western ones. And from those who lived in Zhetisu, at the same time, on the basis of autosomal material, scientists found out that the Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and Turkic people of Siberia are the genetic descendants of Sakas and Scythians, who lived in Central and Eastern Kazakhstan. Okay, here we are, the DNA lab. I was told the results are in. So I'm going to see if there is any interesting blood that I have. Uh, it's going to be a blood mix or something from this part of the world. Or maybe something exotic. Uh, let's go find out. Geneticist Dina Mokushkina, the head of the laboratory, is already waiting for me to tell the results of my DNA test. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hello. Thank you. Okay. Your results are in. We'll discuss results of your test. Let's have a look into the results. I was told that they're in. Yeah. Um, I've never done this before, so how does that look like? Our test results are issued in this format, in form of a book. In your case, we examined the Y chromosome. Y chromosome is passed down the male line. That is from your father, from your grandfather, from your great-grandfather, from your great-great-grandfather, and from you to your grandchildren and beyond. That is the male line of your family. We usually examine 24, but in your case, we examine 27 loci. Loci are fragments of your Y chromosome. And for each locus, we determine the number of repeating lines. It's a genetic profile, yeah, and it's unique for each family. For example, if you take another family and, well, men from another family, they will have completely different data. These numbers are, so to speak, a genetic code of your Y chromosome. And according to these markers, we determined your haplogroup and it's presented like this. So what does that mean? I mean, a haplogroup is a population of people with similar common genetic markers. Right. Uh, Variations of haplogroups are different. Well, there are about 25 various haplogroups among men. You see, right? Here is a map of their migration. They went in different directions. And this is initially the very first haplogroup. It's conventionally referred as an A. This is why chromosomal Adam. You know Adam and Eve from religious beliefs, don't you? It's the same thing. 
There was a population of people, and its men were able to pass the Y chromosome to modern men. That is, about 100, 105 or 150,000 years ago, this Y chromosome appeared, and it was passed basically unaltered, of course. Modern technology has given us a great opportunity to trace our ancestry. The test is carried out both with the help of Y-DNA from paternal line and on the maternal line using mitochondrial DNA. The maternal line is very informative since it gives information about predisposition to various diseases and your origin as well. Y-DNA is only passed from father to son, while mother genes are passed to all children of a woman. Let's hear what geneticist Anna Ter Pogosian has to say. Uh, of the specific person who done this, the, the test, mm -hmm. and we can look into the test and, and make uh, a quite informative and uh, clear picture of, of who your ancestors were. Uh, we, for now, for sure, we know that uh, there are no one ancestor uh, because we can look back through the history where, where your relatives were born, how they moved, and uh, the maternal DNA gives, a, gives us this uh, an amazing opportunity. For example, uh, there are, we, we do the test of haplogroups, which is mtDNA, and we can look through how your ancestors moved from, for example, Africa, um, to what continents, and, and then where, where, where did they um, end, let's say so. Well, a direct female line of heredity, what is it good for? See, like a direct male line, it can't stand serious distortions. That is, you get what you preserve. If your ancestors had this line, it stays in you. And almost always, by its mutations, you can build a clear hierarchy of those mutations to find out when you separate it from other populations, from other people. Scientists had to spend about 13 years and 3 billion USD for the first ever decoding of the human genome. Now, test has become affordable to a broad range of people, increasingly turning to scientists to get necessary information. Some of them want to know about the origin and the history of their families, while others would like to learn about the risks of potential diseases, the degree of tendency to obesity, diabetes, cancer, or etc. Three haplogroups came out of Africa from Y chromosomal Adam. That is, it was the first migration. Well, basically, there were migrations through the Middle East and to the Middle East. Yeah. From there, they went either to the West or to the East. Here, in your case, you should look at the chronology of haplogroups. If you look at the chronology of the haplogroups, here, you can see the first chromosomal atom. Yeah, the Africa one. No. Okay. Then the haplogroup F emerged from it. Now let's look at the map. Yes, it would be more convenient. Let's look at the map, okay. okay. First, it was the haplogroup F. Three haplogroups, I, G, and K, have emerged from it. The K haplogroup, in turn, gave us the haplogroup O and the haplogroup N. No, excuse me, the haplogroup P and the haplogroup N. And your haplogroup R has come out of the haplogroup P here. And your haplogroup R is still divided into branches, so-called subclades. There are R1, R1A, R1B and R2. Your branch is R1A. So your subclade is a R1AZ282, yes. That is, this alphanumeric names are the designation of mutations. Well, the genetics, they just use them in the classification, so to speak, to distinguish them among the different haplogroups. Well, your haplogroup survived for so long, yes, that is its timeline. It was formed 25 to 30,000 years ago, your haplogroup R. And your closest common ancestor lived about 22,000 years ago. Then the haplogroup began to split into different subclades, as I already mentioned, yes. And their migration was also different. That is, carriers of R2 remain mainly in the Middle East. 
R1A and R1B move to the territory of Central and Eastern Europe and R1B moved to the Western Europe on the territory of modern Britain and Great Britain, like this. But on the territory of Central Asia, this branch is also present. Why? Because there were events such as conquests of land, yes, and so on, history went on. Therefore, some part, look here, some part of the population returned in the course of various historical events and it followed through Central Asia up to Hindustan, that is, to modern India. In fact, research like that allow us to go back 70,000 years ago to look at our family tree and maybe learn who our ancestors were. So, as we can see, uh in this test, there is a general ancestor, which most uh, genetic uh, tests are providing. How many percents of uh, what nationalities do you have in you? Okay. In my case, I do have 84% uh, uh, of uh, European blood, which is Italian, Russian, Finn, and others. But the, the more we go back, uh, the less percentage we see. So, for example, my ancestors are Surui people from Brazil. Mm -hmm. which uh, is 0.7 percent. It's not much, which means that it goes back. Also, thanks to modern technology, it has become possible to map and describe how and approximately when the ancestors of humans and closely related species moved. There is the Human Genome Project, which is a huge database that makes it possible to compare samples and find relatives of people who have already done DNA tests to see who is related to who. Your subclade remained on the territory of Europe, and it remained as it was. Well, I mean, now you'll see how often it's found among the population. Well, you'll be surprised, but the upper castes of India have the highest share of matching. So I am uh, genetically 72% Indian. Well, not really. Look, here are your markers that we have identified. It turns out that they are found in 72% of the Brahmins. It's hard to imagine millions of changes and random mutations accumulated in the genome, which people have passed on from generation to generation over tens of thousands of years. They led to the emergence of genetic markers which are more common in some ethnic groups and less common in others. Now, thanks to them, we can look back hundreds of years and have better understanding of our personal history. Uh, I can see here at this table that, mm -hmm. for example, Kazakhs and Chechens, so Kazakhs are 4%. So I share the, the blood, mm -hmm. the Kazakhs at the 4% level, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's a whole 4%. Yeah, that was en enough, I guess, to make me come all the way here from Australia. Yes, that is, according to the checklist of the nationalities, 4% of Kazakhs share common genetic markers with your genetic profile. Why did it happen? As I said earlier, this is the Asian branch of your haplogroup. And these Kazakhs, these 4% of Kazakhs, they live in Northern Kazakhstan and Eastern Kazakhstan. They are part of Middle and Junior Juzes. You see? And the Southern and Eastern Kazakhs, for example, they have haplogroups from Mongolia, China, and even some parts of India. Turns out I actually have a bit of nomadic DNA in me. Maybe because of that, I actually returned to Kazakhstan and study the history of the Great Steppe. You know what I've learned while studying the subject and meeting different people? First of all, a nation is a single ideology, the spirit of the people that brings them together. There are 127 ethnic groups living in Kazakhstan, but they all form one nation. And every day I feel more and more like a part of it. It was Daniel Besseren, and you've been watching Searching for Mystery. I'll see you next time.